On March 3rd, 1972, humanity sent out a message, a golden plaque attached to two spacecraft that would leave our solar system and travel for millions of years. A plaque that contained a message for aliens. It was designed by Carl Sagan and NASA, designed so that one day, beings who did not understand our language could ask, what does it say? Where did it come from? And who could have sent it? And they would get an answer. This is the story about how humans talk to aliens and the message NASA wants them to see. Carl Sagan had a problem. He had helped design the Mariner program, NASA's first attempt at exploring the inner planets. But not everything had gone to plan. Mariner 1 was destroyed after launch due to a software error. A missing hyphen in the code caused one of the most expensive single character related errors in history. Mariner 3 failed to deploy its solar panels and antennas. Mariner 4 did reach Mars for the first time, but that same year, the National Academy of Sciences said it was reasonable for the red planet to host living organisms. All Mariner 4 sent back were blurry images of a small part of the planet covered in black and white craters more similar to our moon than Earth. It was a world that was dead. Mariner 8 was scattered across the ocean. It lasted all of five minutes before a failed circuit in the rocket brought it crashing back to Earth. Disappointment at the mixed success of the Mariner probes, the escalating cost of the Apollo program, and the Vietnam War, excitement for space was waning. But then Mariner 9 arrived at the Red Planet successfully. It was the first time humanity orbited another planet. They'd beaten the Soviets, but the achievement was short-lived. Mars was covered in dust. It was supposed to show the planet in a new light, but Mariner 4's dead images seemed accurate. However, there were some who had theorized that Mars's seasonal color changes were not caused by vegetation or water, but by sandstorms. And Sagan was right. When the dust cleared, the world watched. Ancient dry riverbeds, volcanoes, canyons, and channels. It was the first real sight of an alien planet. While some Mariner probes were failures, Mariner 9 was a historic achievement. Sagan got the world's attention, but that success created his problem. Enthusiasm to go much further. In the mid-1960s, the aerospace engineer, Gary Flandreau, was working at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and he discovered something. Roughly once every 175 years, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune aligned on the same side of the Sun a narrow chance to reach them all. So NASA formed a working group to explore launching multiple probes to the outer planets on a grand tour before that 175 year window closed. But they weren't going to launch multiple spacecraft that were guaranteed to fail. They needed to make sure that at least one could survive the asteroid belt and the intense radiation of Jupiter. They needed a pioneer. The Jupiter Pioneers were built by TRW Systems of Redondo Beach, California, under contract to NASA's Ames Research Center. The project involved some 25 million man-hours of meticulous work by the government, industry, university, pioneer team. It would be the first spacecraft to fly beyond Mars, the first to get through the asteroid belt, and the first to fly past Jupiter. Eventually, it'd go fast enough to be the first to be placed on a trajectory to leave the solar system entirely. For Eric Burgess, this was an opportunity. Pioneer 10 was our first letter to the stars. Can't we attach a message to it should it ever be discovered by an alien life, he thought. Excited, he brought it up to Richard Hoagland and Don Bain. They in turn brought it up to Sagan, and he agreed. Then NASA accepted. But the idea was easier than action. How do we communicate to beings worlds apart? How do we tell them when and where we came from? What is a human actually? And could he figure out the answer to those questions in only 
three weeks. He and Dr. Frank Drake would design the message. Linda Salzman, his wife, would prepare the final artwork for NASA. The message had to be easy to construct and strong. It had to handle space for potentially hundreds of millions of years, and it had to be small and light enough so that it didn't interfere with the rest of the spacecraft. So aluminum with gold anodization was chosen to make it more resistant. It was a small but strong canvas. By early February, the three began answering the questions. Humans vary in appearance. To represent all of us, each choice could show bias. So Linda drew ambiguously, a man and woman, adult, but of an indeterminate age and ethnicity. I wanted to give the best proportions I could do, and that was the inspiration. I wanted each figure to have different racial features. The woman has very almond eyes and straight hair, and I made the man's hair curly. I made his nose kind of flattened so that they were multicultural, that they had uh, different human characteristics. The man's arm is raised in a universal terrestrial greeting. It shows off our fingers, opposable thumbs, and movable arms. If both raise their hands, it could falsely indicate this pose as a fundamental part of the human body. They couldn't hold hands, since that would risk it being mistaken as one being. Paying homage to Greek sculptures, they were drawn in the nude. It showed humans did not reproduce asexually, with belly buttons and reproductive organs. Despite being us, the team worried about the reception. So, I was torn. There were only so many days, I think like five days until the plaque could be put on the spacecraft. And Carl, he said, don't do anything because we don't want to get into a big fight with NASA and give anybody an excuse not to put the plaque on the spacecraft. The design lacked a line. The woman basically didn't have a vagina. And that was because Sagan was worried that NASA would reject it. Who knows what could have happened? But his concerns were unfortunately justified. NASA was very sensitive to this because there were some members of Congress who, in the American Congress, who were very conservative. Um, and they were offended that the taxpayers' money was being used to send smut to space. Images of the plaque made headlines for many, it was the first time naked humans were seen in newspapers. I had the personal experience of discussing this on a national morning television show in Canada. And when I was through describing it, I looked around and everybody in the room was horrified. I said, what's wrong? He said, oh, we're all going to be fired. We're going to lose our jobs. This is the first time a naked human has ever been shown on Canadian television and it's forbidden. Despite the criticism, Linda's interstellar nudes pushed through. But with the deadline looming and so many moving pieces, they couldn't afford to wait. The team had to take risks, decisions that were critical to the mission's success. Today's businesses face the same challenges. Udu is an all-in-one management software that offers a wide range of applications designed for day-to-day -day business management. If you're a diverse team with a big idea, you don't have time to waste on expensive apps that aren't integrated. With access to over 45 easy to use applications in one ecosystem, you can meet all your needs without friction. Easily keep track of your accounting, communicate quickly with your team, or manage manufacturing orders. Sagan might've appreciated that. Get one software that does it all. You don't need to wait for the planets to align. Get your first application free for life with unlimited hosting and support, and simply add more as you grow with full access to the suite of apps starting at just 19.90 euros per month. Try Udu now by visiting udu.com slash r slash hoog. Language on Earth is complicated. There are thousands, even more regional variations. Instead of words, they needed something universal. One plus one always equals two. It will be on Earth, on Mars, or circling an alien sun thousands of light years away but a number can be denoted by an infinite amount of symbols. Sagan and Drake needed something simpler. Binary can represent any number 
as an increasingly long string of ones and zeros. Instead of 10 individual symbols, binary just needs two, one and zero, or a vertical and horizontal dash. One of the shortest strings of vertical and horizontal dashes is next to the woman. Since there are four digits, the string can be read from left to right, one zero zero zero. Two raised to the power of three on, the rest off, eight. But eight what? Drake and Sagan had narrowed how to count, but they needed a universal measurement. And luckily, they had one. Hydrogen is the simplest element, one proton, one electron. It makes up 75% of all matter in the universe. When the electron in a neutral hydrogen atom changes its spin state, it produces a photon in the form of a radio wave. It has a wavelength of 21 centimeters. Since hydrogen is widespread across the universe, the strength and direction of this radio wave can help locate large hydrogen clouds and map the structure of the universe. Sagan and Drake assumed that any advanced alien society would know this wavelength. On the plaque, the two circles represent the two states of hydrogen. The pin on the outside indicates a single electron, flipping directions relative to the single proton. Between the two states is a single binary symbol. This wavelength is what Sagan and Drake wanted the aliens to be counting. Eight times the wavelength is 168 centimeters, five feet, six inches, the average height of humans. The figures are drawn in front of the Pioneer spacecraft relative to scale, allowing the reader to check their work. And if they could communicate the length of humans, they could scale it up to the level of the universe. Pioneer 10 was launched towards the eye of Taurus. It would take two million years to reach our neighbors in Aldebaran. Pioneer 11 was shot in the opposite direction towards the Scutum constellation. It could arrive at the closest main star in four million years. In order to find Earth in the vast scale of our galaxy, they needed a galactic scale form of triangulation. After a supernova, stars can leave behind a tiny, powerful neutron star, pulsars. They emit high energy particles at each magnetic pole. This causes a unique, predictable, invisible pulse of radiation when they rotate. They're a cosmic lighthouse, bright and have lifespans measured in tens of millions of years. Drake picked out some of the longest living and brightest. Although triangulation can be achieved with as few as three, Drake included 14. It was more than what was needed, but there were still some issues. Pulsars are found in three dimensions. The plaque has only two. This cluster of radio lines is a map of the nearest pulsars from our sun. They'd X and Y, but they needed a Z. So Drake added a 15th line. This line represents the distance from the center of the galaxy, the galactic plane. When the angle between the galactic plane and the pulsar is positive, the star is above the galactic plane. Negative, it's below. The length of each of the pulsar's lines relative to the galactic plane produces a relative distance to the sun and the center of the galaxy. But the pulsar map actually had one more dimension. Since pulsars gradually decrease in frequency at a predictable rate over time, Sagan and Drake's map could be used to determine the age of the spacecraft. However, they could narrow down our location even more. Planets lying in the habitable zones of solar systems are fairly common, but our system has a rare configuration. Four small rocky planets near the sun with four larger gas giants further out. An ordered system. At the bottom of the plaque is our unique solar system. The line to the sixth planet represents Saturn's rings, Pluto at the end. The launch of Pioneer coincided with the brief cosmic blip in our history where Pluto was still considered a planet, and they hadn't figured out that Saturn wasn't the only one with rings. Either way, it didn't matter. The diagram told the readers that our solar system has roughly nine planets, with the binary indicating the distance from our sun. Here, however, they made a decision under the constraint of time. Earth is about 148 million kilometers from the sun. They would need a binary string of 40 digits to indicate the distance, and they didn't have enough space. By mid-February, Drake had finished calculating the binary values for the 14 pulsar maps, which left the planetary distances on the back burner. So they rushed. They replaced the existing dashes with serifs, capped at the end like a capital I. It was a sloppy but new value, one-tenth the semi-major axis orbit of Mercury, or about 5.7 million kilometers. 
It wouldn't be possible to determine this value without examining our solar system. But still, the combination of the planetary system and the pulsar map were a good enough hint. However, they made one more controversial anthropocentric decision. A line drawn from the third planet indicates the spacecraft's rough path, tipped with an arrow. Whether the arrow was a universal symbol or primarily a human one is left an open question. By the end of February, they were out of time. The diagrams were etched 0.1 millimeters deep to remain readable even after micrometeorite damage. It was mounted in reverse on the antenna support, faced inward to reduce damage. According to Sagan, the message finally agreed upon is in our view an adequate but hardly ideal solution to the problem. Pioneer 10 launched on March 3, 1972. Pioneer 10 waits for launch atop a new three-stage version of the Atlas Centaur rocket. And Pioneer 11 launched a year later on April 6, 1973. Like the Mariner program before it, there was concern about whether each spacecraft would even make it to Jupiter, let alone interstellar space. But by February of 1973, Pioneer 10 emerged from the asteroid belt. By November, color renderings of Jupiter were returned in almost real time to Earth. It captured the first close-up images of the Jovian icy moons. Now the pull of Jupiter's gravity speeds it up to a fantastic 82,000 miles per hour. In effect, this crack-the-whip left turn gives Pioneer another rocket stage to fling it out of the solar system. It reached Uranus in 1979 and passed the orbit of Neptune on June 13, 1983. It was the first man-made object to head to the stars. By the conservative metrics of NASA, both missions were a success. As far as anyone can tell, they still continue forward. The plaques were only a small part of that success, a three-week afterthought. Sagan may not have thought their message was ideal, but luckily, he was given another chance. <laughs>